Good morning. My name is Sherman Stanford, and this is Making Sense of the Chaos. There was a little fog outside this morning as I was walking, and that reminded me of the fog of chaos that exists in the world. And there's a lot of fog of chaos. Listen, um, I thought about this too on my walk this morning. I get up early every morning. I already walked five miles. <laughs> I'll probably walk about 10 or 12 more before the day is over because it's better than sitting on my butt. <clears throat> anyway, I was thinking that uh, we all want to spend our lives in pursuit of something that's uh, noble and high and glorious. And we, we know we're going to die, but we would like to live devoting our lives to something that has great meaning. Now, a, a lot of times we're confused about that because, well, some of us think that there simply is nothing that has great meaning and purpose. Or, if we believe that, yes, great meaning and purpose exists in the world, we're confused about where to find it. What is it? Uh, well, that's what we're talking about here. I don't want anybody to be spending their lives in futility, uh, just walking a daily treadmill and, and going nowhere and accomplishing nothing, and uh, where the sum total of your existence is just adding up, uh, adding to your list of pleasures indulged in. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. There has to be more to life than that. Uh, that's, just, that's just too depressing to even contemplate. And so, I believe that's true. There is more to life than that. And that getting a, a proper understanding of what is really going on in the world, how should we be spending our lives, what should we be doing, and how to get our priorities in order is the first item on on the agenda and that's what that's what we're trying to do here we're trying to make sense of the chaos of the world there is purpose and order to the world and there is a way to figure out what you ought to be doing there are a lot of false steps and, and blind alleys and, and wrong turns to make that's true but you're not going to figure all that out by going down every wrong alley and and uh blind alley and wrong road and taking every possible false step. One of the things I used to tell my clients is that as I got older, I still made plenty of mistakes, still still ran into ruts in the road, but I'd gotten to the point where I no longer backed up to be sure I didn't miss any of the ruts. <laughs> and that's a good idea. <laughs> if at least we, we're, we're not having to hit every rut, maybe we can make some progress, don't you think? So let's, let's reiterate our seven basic truths about reality to set a framework, a framework, a skeleton as it were, for fitting in the uh, details to make a picture that we can then make sense of, which of course is what we're doing, trying to make sense of the chaos. First, there is a God, and he is the God of the Bible, and he created the cosmos for his glory, he did not create it for any other purpose, not for man's glory, for sure. Second, the jewel of creation, although we don't deserve it, is mankind. Third, although in no sense the author of evil, God as the creator and the sovereign power in the cosmos, ordained Adam's fall. He had to do that if Adam was going to fall. Otherwise, Adam would be acting outside of God's plan. And if God has a plan that doesn't encompass everything, if there are wild elements that just happen and God is not in control of, then God's not in control of anything. If you think that through just a little bit, you'll realize that God has to be in control of everything or he's in control of nothing. And if you want to live in a world where there's no God in control of everything, and stuff just happens. Well, help yourself, but man, that's a scary, scary scenario. Fourth, in Adam, the entire creation fell. That's something we have a hard time realizing. It wasn't just Adam that fell. It wasn't just humanity in Adam that fell, although that's a big enough chunk to try to swallow. The entire creation fell. Paul tells us in Romans 8 that the earth 
creation groans, not just the earth, the creation groans awaiting its redemption, its restoration. Now, it's in the process of being restored, but it will not be finally restored until the, 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 the final resurrection, that is the judgment day. Fifth, as a result of the fall, God pronounced the curse of enmity between the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, and all of those in him, and the seed of the serpent. That's, uh, that would be the original Adam, although I, I believe that he was uh, saved by God, uh, given a, a new heart. Um, but anyway, the original Adam, all of his progeny, Satan, all of his demons. This is known as the great antithesis. Sixth, all subsequent human social experience, what we call history, is an outworking of this antithesis, this division of hum humanity to two great uh, to, um, large groups that are continually at odds with one another. And how does that play itself out? That's the story of history. Seventh, you got to bear this in mind. The unregenerate, those who never are willing to turn to God, are without excuse. They know God. They know that He is God. They know that He is Creator. The creation screams at Him every detail. But they suppress the truth that they know uh, in culpable self-deceit. Paul says they exchange the truth of God for a lie. Okay, now we're talking about the development of the early church uh, up to the 16th century with, with, to, until the Reformation, which I contend is the greatest event uh, after Jesus' birth, uh, life, and death on the cross and his resurrection. It's the greatest event. Uh, it's a watershed event in the, in, the, in the history of the world, in the, in the development of civilization generally, not just the Western civilization, but all of civil, civilization. It, it is the, uh, the division between uh, darkness and growing light. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge, huge event. But, of course, it, it didn't just happen. It, it was a product of a number of forces, act, ideas and forces acting over time, finally culminating in the 16th century. But right now we're in the 4th century. We're talking about Constantine and the Roman Empire and its relationship to the early church. Remember now, Constantine was the one who had the dream the night before a battle where uh, uh, he, he, was, he was told to conquer in this name which, uh, or this sign, which was the cross. And uh, he believed that this was a sign from God that... Uh, that he was going to be blessed and have a victory in the battle the next day. So he had all of his equipment, or as much as he could have, uh, painted with the, with the cross. And then he went into the battle, and he won it. As a result of that, in gratitude to God, and probably, probably true faith, uh, he uh, began making tremendous changes, incorporating Christianity into the Roman Empire. This, of course, it ends up being a double-edged sword. While it does cut very well one way, it ends up cutting too well the other way as, as well. <clears throat> anyway, uh, to recommence our story, the Roman emperors were neither stupid nor politically naive. The single issue that had been dividing, that had been excluding, uh, the cause of the exclusion of the Christian church from acceptance in the Roman Empire and Christians as being treated as, as the atheists, was that they refused to swear allegiance to emperor. Uh, to the emperor, uh, they had to swear kudios kaiser, which would be Caesar is Lord. Now, of course, for Christians, Jesus is Lord. And so for them, it was kudios Christos, not kudios kaiser. And, uh, of course, the emperors were aware of this, of the significance of this, difference and that uh, uh, they, they had never uh, secular authorities except in the limited case of, of uh, Jerusalem, the Israelites uh, 
the Jews. Secular authorities had never understood there to be a separation between church and state or for the church to be equal in power with the state in a different sphere. That was an entirely alien concept. Uh, everything, uh, all authority within the church was, I mean, within the, uh, the state in the ancient world was held by the civil ruler of each nation state. They understood the implications of Christianity, of Kyrios Christos, Jesus is Lord, and they rejected Christianity unless Christians would be willing to abjure Jesus' supreme authority and confess that Caesar is Lord. This, most Christians would not do. Hence, Christianity was outlawed, forcing Christians to practice their religion sub rosa, that is, underground. For centuries, therefore, the lines of enmity had been clearly drawn, almost three centuries at this point. Constantine's acceptance of the Christian church as a legal religion was at least in the limited sense of Constantine's uh, intention to act on behalf of Christ in his role as Caesar, a tacit acceptance in principle of the supremacy of Christ over Caesar, a truly profound development. Really, really, really big. It's hard to overstate that. The uh, bishop of Rome, who was the pastor of the Roman church there, and there wasn't a church building. There was, the church was a, a house church that met in somebody's house uh, and, and met uh, surreptitiously, that is, in secret. Uh, it, was, it, was not, it was not a legal religion. Anyway, the, his name was Miltiades. And in response to Constantine's action, uh, he was a, a reluctant bride suspicious and guarded. And so there wasn't a whole lot of uh, syncretization between the Christian religion and Rome uh, during his tenure. Now, syncretization means uh, blending of two thought or belief systems together. Okay, So you've got Christianity, which is a belief system, a thought system, and you have secular Romanism, which is a belief system, and uh, mixing the two together, grace and power, is uh, not a good idea. And, and, and ends up not working out well for the church. However, Miltiades' successor, Sylvester, was much warmer in his embrace of both Constantine and Roman power. Malachi Martin, uh, in his book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Church, uh, writes, Sylvester, however, by now has seen a new form for the church. It could spread by means of Roman roads, Roman arms, Roman law, Roman power. The world would belong to Jesus entirely because the world was dominated by Rome, remember? Thus, he writes, the triumph and blessing could be prepared. Besides, Sylvester remembers, no one knows when Jesus will reappear. Therefore, why not make straight the way of the Lord? End quote. In a relatively short time, the syncretistic marriage of love, grace, and mercy to civil power, force, was fully consummated. Martin writes further, quote, All anti-church laws will be revoked. Constantine abolishes crucifixion as a supreme capital punishment. No criminal should die in the same way as Jesus the Christ died for men's sins. Sunday will be a public holiday in honor of Jesus' resurrection. Throughout the West, Constantine decides he will use the bishops of the church just as former Roman emperors used the pontiffs of the old Roman College of Pontiffs, with the Pope being supreme pontiff. Uh, that would be, the pontiffs were uh, a sort of a religious council that uh, aided the, uh, the emperor in uh, administering the empire. All bishops will have civil jurisdiction. That's a pretty serious st step. And you can see the invitation for abuse there. Pope Sylvester and his successors will try to extend their domination over the eastern half of the Roman Empire. Later, successive popes will try to extend their domination over the eastern half as well, including Constantine's new capital, uh, Constantinople, thus forcing 
the first great split in Christianity. But neither Constantine nor Sylvester can foresee this. They are looking merely at immediate problems. These two men, the Pope and the Emperor, have now set the stage for the next 1600 years. The Church of Rome will always be allied with some temporal power. At one stage, it will even claim to be the source of all worldly power, political, civil, military, diplomatic, financial, cultural. And it will make that claim stick for quite some time. But what a price it will pay, he writes. End quote. That's a brief synopsis of what's going to happen uh, all the way, actually, until the present within the Roman Catholic Church. As the empire's ecclesiastical arm, the church ultimately adopted the Roman centralized, top-down administrative model to accomplish the spread of the church throughout the civilized world. This is called the hierarchical model, albeit through syncretizing worldly and spiritual power. Worldly power is force. Spiritual power is God's grace, working, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit working through His grace. The civil power the church exercised, however, produced limited spiritual good in the growth of the church. You're not, gonna, you're not going to grow your church, which is a ministry of God's grace, through the use of worldly power. It just doesn't happen. It, it's, it's so seductive to think that you can that that you can that you can buy or force uh, converts, but you can't, because God, by His sovereign grace, changes hearts, or He doesn't. And uh, except, of course, for the necessary amount of uh, worldly power to stay alive and to communicate your message, you know, you have to have enough money to buy food. Today, you have to have enough resources to be able to buy uh, the means of communication so you can disseminate your message. But other than that, worldly power does not produce uh, changed hearts. Over the course of centuries, the seduction of church leaders by the temptation to use worldly power to achieve otherworldly ends often distorted the gospel message into merely a convenient adjunct to worldly power, badly blurring its message of grace and mercy. When I was a child, uh, I was a Catholic, and when I would go to church, everything except the homily, the sermon, which was only a 10 or 20 minute homily, it was not very much of the, of the, uh, the hour we spent in church anyway. And that was if you'd gone to a high mass. It was, it was an hour. If you hadn't, then it was, a, it was less than that. But uh, the rest of the church service would be conducted in Latin. Even the songs would be sung in Latin. Now, I'm not exactly sure how many of the people in that church, and I would assume there were two to 300 people in the church, knew Latin. But I think a safe guess would be one, the priest, and he probably didn't know it very well, but nobody else did. So, how much did we understand of what was going on? Well, not very much. But you see, from the perspective of a church that has been using worldly power to gain uh, gracious ends, it doesn't really matter. It's just a question of forms, because if you can capture the uh, people through the use of superstition, which is fear, basically, and you can manipulate them by fear, uh, you, you, don't, you don't have to have a message that they understand and that appeals to their hearts. It, it's, it doesn't really make any difference. The primary goals of much of the church leadership eventually shifted from the propagation of the gospel through the care and of souls to gaining, holding, and using worldly power. We have examples of popes excommunicating civil leaders uh, 
because they hadn't they had, they had violated uh, some stricture of the Pope, some commandment of the Pope. This included its most widely available earthly expressions, material wealth, and political power. Very seductive. By the early 16th century, God was prepared to deal with the powerful Roman Catholic Church as he had dealt with Babylon long before the birth of Christ, which after God raised it up to conquer Israel and to, to bring them into captivity, suffered harsh judgment by the hand of God. In this case, his instrument to launch the onslaught against the Roman church was an Augustinian monk in Germany, uh, Saxony. There was, no, there was no nation known as Germany, and there were up to 400 principalities in what's called Germany today. And one of the largest of those was, uh, was Saxony. Anyway, this monk's name was Martin Luther. Not to be confused with Martin Luther King. He came a lot later. And uh, uh, arguably wasn't even a Christian. That's a discussion for another time. The underlying issue over which God provoked the attack was the church's arrogant disregard of God's authority, which he had asserted through his word, the Bible. Immediately precipitating Luther's challenging church authorities was the most salient spiritual abuse of the church, undermining the message of grace at that time, the sale of indulgences. So now we get to the Reformation. Aha! All right. We'll be talking about that for a while. The milieu into which Martin Luther stepped at the beginning of the 16th century was a diffuse feudal culture dominated by the Roman Catholic Church. Um, let me see if I can explain a little bit about the culture at the time, which will help you to understand how the Reformation happened. Um, first of all, you have to understand that uh, in, the, in the entirety of, Rome, of uh, Europe, there were about 90 million people, okay? That sounds like a lot of people. Well, by contrast, today in Europe, there are about 740 million people. So it means that the population of Europe at the time was about one-eighth of what it is today. And there were, there were no automobiles, no trains, no buses, no planes. So there were uh, no means of mass transportation or instantaneous transportation. Transportation was as fast as you could walk or you could drive uh, or you could um, get a, a horse to move. That was it. Uh, so if people were uh, widely separated, it was a much more significant issue than it is today. Additionally, the, the means of communication were much, much uh, slower and fewer. In about 1440, the uh, printing press had been invented by Johann Gutenberg in Germany. And so by the time that Luther arrived in 1517, uh, there was a growing middle class, there was a growing level of uh, literacy. Uh, and the middle class, of course, is always the, the key question in the, the uh, direction that any culture takes because it will have the balancing weight between the upper class and the lower, cl lower class. In, 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 any, in any political election, any astute political observer will tell you that it's the center that determines the outcome. It's not the right and it's not the left. It's the center. So if the center moves a little to the right, then the entire populace will move to the right. The election results will be to the right. If it moves to the left, it will be to the left. Well, you have to have a middle class in order for that to occur. If you have just just the landowners and not the, the peasants and serfs, well then, I mean, they're not the middle class. Landowners and peasants and serfs are not a middle class. Well, obviously, the, the horizon will be dominated by the landowners. But with a growing middle class, and there was, there were tradesmen and, and businessmen and craftsmen that were uh, becoming 
more uh, numerous. Uh, and there was a growth of cities where, of course, uh, information could be communicated more easily. And, and with the printing press, information could be communicated more easily. And so it was going to be a, a little more difficult to keep the people suppressed in superstition and fear because ideas have a way of defeating superstitions and fears. Uh, so you need to understand that this was happening at the time. Now, additionally, in Germany, uh, you have uh, uh, this fragmented political structure with as many as 400 principalities. And, and, uh, and also, the, you, at the same time, the, uh, the Turks, the Muslims, were advancing from the east against Europe. And so the Holy Roman em Emperor, Charles V, uh, he had a... Uh, he had to be very careful in how he dealt with Germany because he needed the princes to help him to make war against the, the Muslims. Uh, all of that combined to create this atmosphere that was perfect for the arrival of Martin Luther. Okay? So I hope that helps you to understand. Uh, the church itself was characterized at that time by ritual religious forms redolent more of paganism than New Testament Christianity, riddled as it was with superstition, black magic, and the naked lust for worldly power. While the bulk of Europe identified as Christian, the level of biblical instruction was no better than the questionable learning and practice of church leadership imposed upon an extremely ignorant, superstitious, and credulous population. Okay. Uh, most of the population was made of, of serfs. And um, we need to understand who the serfs were. Commonly, we th we're told that, uh, that serfs were slaves, but that really isn't exactly true. They couldn't be bought and sold individually. The truth is that the serfs belonged to the land. They did not belong to the land owners, separately from the land. They could not be bought and sold by landowners. When land was sold, the serfs went with it. And so um, the landowners, when they bought the land, they assumed the responsibility for taking care of the serfs. And the serfs, because they belonged to the land, they knew they had a responsibility for taking care of the land, which, of course, took care of the landowner. And uh, they were required... To, uh, they, they were given plots of their own, but they were required to work two, three, or more days per week for the landowner in exchange for being able to work their own land. Um, it was, uh, I mean, it was an agricultural uh, economy. I mean, thinking of a way to make agriculture work, but the, the, there weren't a the modern machines for agriculture at that time. It was a labor-intensive uh, enterprise. It required people working the land with hoes and shovels and plows. And uh, since uh, each man would struggle to make a living on his own piece of land. He had to have ways of getting people working together to do the larger projects. Uh, and, and so this is how the, the system developed. Okay. Most of the priests of the church, while giving lip service to the notion of clerical celibacy, lived with concubines, what are currently termed common law wives, and fathered numerous illegitimate children. Adding to their ineffectiveness in faithfully teaching God's word, many of the clergy were barely able to read and write. That was a terrible problem within the church. Uh, you had a lot of illiterate priests. It was, it was bad. So, of course, they practiced at best a nominal worldly religion that had more in common with paganism than with the religion of Jesus with its focus on salvation by grace through faith in the Messiah alone. Among the princes of the church, 
as the hierarchy was called, thus adding credence to the comparison of the church to institu institutions of worldly authority, there was little pretense of spiritual practice. Popes, bishops, and cardinals rarely preached or conducted religious services. Okay, they leave that to the priests, and they would they would nominate priests as their underlings. In fact, they sold their offices to priests who who would work for a lot less uh, than the income of of their uh, diocese. Except for practicing a number of empty religious rituals, their lives were far more secular and worldly than religious. The power they exercised was usually, in practical function, political rather than spiritual. Offices within the church were routinely purchased with the expectation of future economic opportunity in view. Simon. Okay? For instance, if you wanted to be a bishop, you paid the Pope, uh, say, 20,000 ducats, and then you were given a bishopric. Uh, after that, when you collected revenue from the bishopric, you shared that with the Pope. And you made up the 20,000 ducats by the income that you got from your, your, your diocese. The purchaser used the office to squeeze profit out of the lay population within his jurisdiction. The people on the bottom, they got it the worst. I'd like to go on, but we've reached the end of our time, and so we'll pick up this uh, thread of this thought tomorrow, and uh, I hope that you have a great day today, and God keeps you safe and healthy and blesses you in every way.